discussing local reflections, local needs. So now to tonight's lecture. I warmly welcome Professor Stephen Tooth and Dr. Hal Griffiths, whose lecture tonight is titled Memories and Perceptions of Hydrological Extremes in Welsh Patagonia. Stephen Tooth is a professor of physical geography at Aberystwyth. Stephen undertook his undergraduate studies at the University of Southampton and completed a PhD at the University of Wollongong in Australia. He has lectured at the University of Nottingham and at the University of Witwatersrand in South Africa. Stephen joined the Department of Geography and Earth Science at Aberystwyth in April 2000, and his main research interests focus on geomorphology and sedimentology, especially in the drylands of Australia and Southern Africa, with particular research themes including anabranching rivers, floodplains and floodouts, wetlands in drylands, channel vegetation interactions, bedrock inf influenced rivers, controls on gully erosion and the use of drylands on earth as analogues for the Martian surface environments. Stephen is also interested in environmental issues more generally, including current debates about gl global climate change and the Anthropocene and in science education. Howell Griffiths is a senior lecturer in physical geography at the Department of Geography and Earth Sciences at Aberystwyth University as well. Originally from Clangunog near Carmarthen, Howell studied for his undergraduate master's and PhD at Aberystwyth before mm -hmm. joining the staff in 2009, where he now teaches through both Welsh and English. His wide ranging research interests include the rates, processes, and controls of landscape processes, notably on rivers, historical documentary records of flooding and drought, and science communication, particularly through collaboration with artists and creative writers. Howell is also associate ed editor of Gwerthon, the Welsh language academic journal. And also Howell is one of our leading poets and has won the crown at the National Eisteddfod in Cardiff in 2008 and the chair in the uh, National Eisteddfod at Maldwin in 2015. So without any further hesitation, welcome to you, Stephen and Hal, and, um, and I hand over to you. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Noswitha, uh, Diolch and uh, Carmen, uh, Amr Cyflwyniad. Uh, thank you very much, Carmen, for the um, uh, for the introduction, uh, and thank you very much, uh, Andrew, and uh, to everyone for the uh, for the very kind invitation uh, to come and speak to you uh, this evening. Um, we're disappointed, of course, not to be uh, not to be with you uh, in person, but uh, um, of course we can re we can record uh, sessions like this, which is great. So uh, we're really really glad to be able to um, to to share uh, our research uh, in Patagonia with you uh, with you tonight. Um, so I will try and share uh, share my screen. Um, so hopefully, when I do that, uh, you'll see that. Is is that visible to people? Yeah. Ah, excellent, excellent. Thank you. Um, okay. So um, yes. Uh, tonight, um, um, Stephen and I uh, are going to talk. Uh, about uh, the memories and perceptions of uh, hydrological extremes in, in Welsh Patagonia and the implications then for sustainable uh, environmental management. And this really um, brings our, our two sets of research interests together, uh, really, to look at how um, people uh, view and perceive and remember uh, flooding uh, and drought uh, in one particular case study in Oladva. Uh, in, in Patagonia, and then how those memories and perceptions then uh, impact on the way we can um, adapt and um, manage uh, the extremes of, uh, um, uh, of flooding and drought that we're likely to see uh, in, in the future. <coughs> um, so we're going to be talking about uh, projects that have been uh, undertaken with um, uh, funding from the British Academy and the British Council uh, and in uh, collaboration with uh, colleagues in uh, the Universidad Nacional de, pa de la Patagonia uh, in Trello, 
uh, in Patagonia as well. So um, many of you, I'm sure, will be uh, will be familiar with uh, the history of uh, of Welsh Patagonia. Um, but if we go back to um, 1855, uh, so ten years or so before um, the um, uh, the Welsh colony was uh, established, back to 1855, uh, the this area of South America was really a new. Uh, poorly known uh, geographical frontier frontier really to uh, to Europeans um it this map here a, Col a Colton map drawn up in 1855 shows uh, the area uh, of the current uh, Welsh colony around the uh, river Chubut valley in, in in Patagonia and you can see the level of, of detail uh, on the map uh, here so two uh, Europeans and two um, many uh, people in, in Wales, this was a relatively poorly known uh, land. But in, uh, eight, in the 1850s and, and early 1860s, there began a, uh, a campaign, if you like, to establish uh, the Welsh colony, uh, uh, in, in Patagonia. Many other places were, were considered, uh, but um, the the weight of the of the campaign, if you like, uh, went behind uh, Patagonia as um, as the, as the colony, and there were many reasons uh, for looking uh, for a colony. Of course, it was part of a wider um, uh, migration from um, the, the the British Isles to um, to the Americas to to North America, uh, particularly, um, and uh, it was part of that. But it was looking at uh, trying to um, find a better life, if you like, from the um, from the heavy industries uh, in Wales, but also looking for uh, religious and cultural freedom and a, a place where um, the, the Welsh language and culture could uh, could develop and, and be be protected in many, in in some ways. So um, Hugh Hughes uh, published um, a, a booklet called Llaw Liver Ladachfa in 1862. And in terms of the environment, he uh, calculated uh, using um, some basic knowledge of, of climatology uh, that the area of um, uh, the area that was being considered for the Welsh colony would receive 142 rainy days per year. And it also makes mention of luscious pastures uh, where agriculture would be able to, um, to thrive. Um, but of course, this is what this is more uh, like the landscape, or this is the landscape that the uh, colonists then were faced with when they arrived uh, in uh, on the eastern coast of um, South America in Patagonia in 1865. Uh, so very much a, a semi-arid uh, landscape with um, you know a, a very different to. Um, to, the, to the landscapes that they were used to uh, in Wales and quite different to the landscape that Hugh Hughes had uh, described. And um, when, of course, they would, have, they would find an environment closer to what Hugh Hughes was describing when they later um, uh, moved, uh, uh, moved towards the Andes. But on the eastern coast of Patagonia, it was uh, a very um, uh, unforgiving uh, landscape in many ways. And Darwin had uh, described um, this broad area from uh, his voyages on, on, on the Beagle um, some years before and had um, not, not quite the Chubut Valley, but uh, a little way south, I think, of the Chubut Valley. It talked about the plain uh, having a very bleak appearance. It's covered with thorny bushes and dry looking grass and will forever remain useless to mankind and talks of the curse of sterility being on the land. Well, that wasn't quite right um, either, because if you look at uh, an aerial image of the, the valley today, we can see that the lower Chubut Valley is, uh, you can see this swathe of uh, green uh, here. And this is the, the lower Chubut Valley, which is used, uh, as, which is very, um, a very fertile sort of agricultural uh, land, uh, now very productive uh, ag agricultural land, due to the um, irrigation scheme, which was established by the, um, uh, the colony. Um, so that's uh, some some historical uh, context, and through the establishment of the um, uh, of the colony, there there is now 
uh, if we look at contemporary uh, Patagonia, there are two main main centers of uh, Welsh uh, language and culture uh, in uh, in Patagonia, and those are uh, the areas around um, the uh, towns of Gaiman, uh, Trelew, uh, Rawson, and uh, Puerto Madryn on the on the east coast um, here, and then uh, in the foothills of the Andes, uh, we also have uh, Trevelin and uh, Eskel, uh, which were established um, towards the end of the 19th century into the into the 20th century. Uh, and between the two, of course, we have this vast uh, pith or desert, I, I guess you could translate that as, but this wide expanse of uh, semi-arid uh, land, which is uh, drained by uh, the, the, the Rio Chubut and some other uh, rivers. So when we started thinking about this project in, in 2013, Stephen and I were interested in Patagonia from, for a number of different uh, reasons. Uh, we uh, applied for funding from the British Academy for a project called uh, Remembering a Hydrographic Society, Flooding, Drought, Adaptation and Culture in a Welsh Colony of Patagonia, uh, Argentina. Uh, and we were lucky enough to get that funding and that, that funding allowed us then to visit uh, Patagonia in uh, January 2014 uh, to undertake some uh, some field work. So what I'm going to do for the rest of the talk is uh, talk a bit about the context for that project, talk about its aims and objectives, and then give some of the um, material that we collected through uh, historical documents and interviews with people in um, uh, in Patagonia, uh, and then. After talking about some findings and conclusions, I'll hand over to Stephen, who will talk a bit more about the recent work that we've done more widely on uh, wetlands and drylands and flash flooding, building on and building in some of the findings that we've we had in that British Academy project. So in terms of, of context, we, we know that the frequency and intensity of extreme hydroclimatic events, so you know, floods and droughts, are expected to increase in future as a result of cl climate change. And I guess the foundation of our project was the question, well, can we learn about how uh, historical societies adapted? How can we adapt uh, to these uh, increased uh, flooding and, and drought uh, frequencies from looking back at past experiences uh, in various places? So how do we deal with these coastal storms, these river flooding that are going to happen more often? But there's also, a, from my perspective, there's a really interesting link uh, and more and more discussion about how society, culture, weather and climate intersect. So the discourses about the, the relationships between local weather, physical objects, uh, and the relationship between local weather uh, and cultural practices. And also how weather memories are passed down through generations, through our social and cultural memory and how they condition and affect future uh, adaptation. Um, so if we think about the example of Truerin, for example, uh, the flooding of the Truerin Valley really sort of casts quite a long shadow over our discussions about water resource management uh, today. And our memory, if you like, of, of Truerin impacts on how we deal with um, flooding and possibly future drought and, and water management. So it's important for us to understand perhaps how um, different societies view and perceive these floods and droughts. So we looked at the Welsh experience in Patagonia as a potential example of where uh, a society was forced to adapt very quickly to an environment which was very alien to them. So they landed on the coast of uh, South America in this semi-arid environment, which was very, very unfamiliar to them. How did they then adapt and are there lessons possibly that we can learn. So our aims and objectives was to analyze the historical uh, and contemporary perceptions of climate extremes in Welsh speaking communities in, in Patagonia. And to do this, we wanted to analyze archival materials, so some of the letters, newspaper reports, novels, poetry, uh, to look at what the main historical perceptions of, of Welsh speaking Patagonia was uh, of the environment. To look at then uh, sites of commemoration in Patagonia, so for example museums, uh, to identify what the official mem memory of uh, flooding and drought was, and then to interview Welsh speakers in Patagonia to look at what the 
inherited memories of climate extremes are uh, and how they affect um, environmental issues today. So just to give you some examples quickly of some of the material that we found in, uh, in literature, and, and to do this, I, I really need to um, uh, acknowledge really the, the work of Marie Emlyn, uh, who has drawn together letters from Patagonia in two uh, excellent volumes, uh, Letters of the Radva, uh, the, the first volume, 1865 to 1945. And there are Fantastic, there's fantastic material in, in those, and I, I've translated most of these quotations from Welsh into English. So uh, in 1865, William Jones uh, says something along the, well, he says this, there is no fresh water here, except for what, that which stays as pools on the land after rain. That which I have had not had any more of since being here than I had in one day in Bala many times. So very quickly seeing the difference between Patagonia uh, and Wales. Then in 1870, uh, we see Lewis Jones uh, talking about the community losing uh, wheat, uh, losing cattle uh, in flooding, uh, but also saying then that despite all this, everyone is comfortable and hearty. So putting quite a positive uh, spin on things despite very difficult circumstances. And then uh, Elinid Morgan, then one of the principal authors of uh, Welsh Patagonia, um, describes uh, a very large flood in 1899, what probably the largest flood that the community had has experienced really there, um, and, uh, which I'll return to later, um, says that we've been truly been in the deep water, seeing the old quiet and fertile valley as one massive lake from hill to hill and from the rocks to the sea, a view that will never be forgotten, which is a key, key passage there. Um, I won't read all, all of these in, in detail, but uh, just to flag up some, some interesting elements, uh, for example, from a letter from uh, Aaron Jenkins uh, to uh, Reverend J. Jenkins in Ohio in 1873, talking about the plan to irrigate and talking about the fact that if I could get some sure plan to irrigate, I could live here like a king. And there's no need for anything except some artistic ability to irrigate. Then we could make this valley a paradise. Uh, and then talking about the fact that the landscape of the valley actually lends itself to irrigation, uh, saying that a canal is already given by nature. So Aaron Jenkins here is talking about the old uh, river, river channels uh, of the river being natural irrigation channels. And then we have also uh, reporters uh, in magazines published uh, in Wales and in, in Patagonia talking about the flood of 1899, for example, being a day long remembered, uh, talking about the little hills that were above the water in 1878, now being completely invisible, and talking about the river uh, flowing on the highest land in the valley, and then there's a sudden drop to a plain on either side. So acknowledging that the river is actually slightly above the valley around it, and if the river floods, then the water finds it quite difficult to drain away. And then we have a, a fantastic, uh, volume called Arlan Gamoy on the banks of the Camoy by uh, W. Mellock Hughes, uh, talking about the attempts of the water to travel along the paths that it previously travelled along, um, and really describing floods in really dramatic language. So the inundation, like an angel of death, destroyed everything in its path. And then in a subsequent flood in 1901, uh, a series of floods around the turn of the century here, uh, saying it caused little damage as the inhabitants had learned the lessons of the first flood and had rebuilt on the neighboring hills far from its reach. So already there's, there's a sign that you know, there's adaptation going on, having learned from previous floods. And then we have really interesting uh, creative prose and poetry as well. So one uh, piece of prose in 1899 talks about uh, drunken Seythenin was neglectful with the floodgates and the result of the flooding of our country, which is really interesting because there's an author in Patagonia here um, referencing the flood myths of Wales, so Cantred Gwaelod and Seythenin, in the context of Patagonia, in the context of, flood, of a flood in Patagonia, uh, and talking about stacks of alfalfa, like boats on the water, for example. Um, so really um, creative ways of describing uh, the flooding. And then poetry, uh, here by uh, James Peter Jones describing the flood like a merciless flood marching like a giant, um, which is again a very, very dramatic way of describing uh, the flooding. 
And then some some more by uh, Elena de Morgan, uh, talking about the 1899 flood um, and a very romantic way of describing the flood. So, for example, she says, uh, so terrible was it, yet so glorious in its majesty and ability. Um, yes, the flood came on us again, making our valley into one large lake from hill to hill. Um, and talking about the, the history of the flood as being really important in the history of Patagonia, the history of all the population of Patagonia, um, the Welsh communities at that time. Uh, and then more recently then, we have um, Irma Hughes-de-Jones, uh, who is a poet uh, in the second half of the 20th century into the 21st century, uh, talking about the river and recognising the fact that the river did flood uh, restlessly, but then that the flood also brought fertile sediment to enrich uh, the land, which is a very interesting, um, shows that, you know, people who were writing about the environment in Patagonia had uh, a very... Um, a deep understanding, if you like, of what the processes of uh, landscape processes that are going on uh, in, in the valley. And so that's just a, a quick taste taster there really of some of the really, really interesting ways that people have written about um, the environment of Patagonia and floods and droughts in particular uh, over, over the years. Uh, we then looked at, we, we visited a number of museums uh, and, and areas around um, Welsh Patagonia. So for example, we looked at uh, some of the signboards that uh, had been placed for visitors on the banks of the Chubut uh, in, uh, near Gaiman, talking about how people had managed the river in the past. We looked at some of the chapels, which are really important uh, architecture of the lower valley of the, of the Chubut in, in near Gaiman and uh, Trelew uh, and Rawson. Um, some of which had been rebuilt on higher land, slightly higher land, to be out of the reach of, of flooding. We looked at some of the exhibits in the museum. So uh, apparently this is the uh, heavy metal door knocker of Lewis Jones's house, which was one of the only things left of the house after the flood event of 1899. So there's re a real kind of sense that, you know, there's material objects commemorating flooding in, in the museums of, of, of Patagonia. And uh, for example, uh, in the museum in Trevelin, there's a very large photograph of flooding uh, in the middle of Trevelin, you know, ha having sort of pride of place, if you like, in, in the museum. So the flooding in particular does have a very important place in how the history of the uh, colony is, um, is commemorated. We then moved on to talk uh, uh, to people in Patagonia. So we, we undertook uh, 38 semi-structured interviews with uh, people in Patagonia. The majority of them were Welsh speaking. Stephen uh, did undertake one or two in, in Spanish and I think one or two in English as well. Um, some of them were uh, descendants of early settlers, some of the first settlers, uh, but um, some were also Spanish speaking descendants and others who had recently migrated to the area. But predominantly, we talked to some of the longer term residents of uh, Gaiman, Trelew, um, uh, and uh, Trevelyan and Escal. So just again, to give a bit of a taste of uh, some of the um, quotations or some of the themes that people talked about. Um, very emotional uh, memories, really, of, of flooding. So for example, um, uh, one of the interviewees remembering how her mother had been upset awfully because she had experienced the 1932 flood and had come to stay in Gaiman from the family farm and very upset seeing the river being very high and had, having to go to the doctor uh, because of that. And uh, many people referencing the 1899 flood being a kind of centre point for the for the for the Vladva. Um, people seeing the 1899 flood in Wales and thinking oh we might perhaps not migrate to Patagonia and people actually leaving uh, Patagonia for other places as a result of the flood as well. And again, uh, one or two um, interviewees also talking about material uh, things. So uh, one of the interviewees referencing a line on the wall in her family house, uh, which had been drawn to mark the level of the 1899 flood. Um, and then, some really interesting um, contemporary perceptions as well. Um, again, showing how people really understood what the river was doing. So um, 
somebody saying the river doesn't carry as much water now, the river has narrowed and invasive willows have taken over, closing the river. And some people have taken the sides of the river down, so had removed the flood embankments. So there's a sense that perhaps the uh, people are in a sense of security from flooding in the, in the lower valley. Uh, and talking about urban areas for, for example, Trelew uh, expanding and, and growing across the floodplain, uh, people building houses where, where there used to be flooding, uh, for example. And this in contrast to um, the previous sort of communities in the valley where the farmers and, and other people would actively go out and manage the banks of the river to ensure that flooding would be kept, would ensure that the river was kept within its banks. And that being a community uh, effort. And um, so just to, in, in a Dufferin, uh, which is the lower valley where Gaiman and Trelew were located, we uh, identified a number of flood events from a combination of the um, archival and, and, um, uh, and interviews. And the main ones, the largest ones, were 1899, 1932, and 1958. And then a large dam, the Florentino Amagino Dam, was built in the early 1960s. People tended to remember uh, the path of the flood water, and they often compared the magnitude of a flood event to a previous flood, especially in the written documents. And they remembered uh, houses and, and, and structures being destroyed or damaged, having to relocate to hillsides for months on end, people not being able to move uh, between uh, farms and towns, the moving, the sighting of chapels on higher ground, and the emigration to other areas of Patagonia and the discouragement of uh, further immigration from Wales. Uh, and also uh, talking about how um, flooding and water management led to salinization of the of the floodplain <laughs> and they also um, were very proud if you like of the way that the water the river had been managed so it, historically how they built levees drained uh, dredged drainage ditches um, etc but that had been that community element had moved to um, to the local authority if you like uh, and had ceased to be a community activity so there was a, a perception, perhaps, that uh, the dam had led to a reduction, the building of the dam had led to a reduction in concern about floods. Uh, but there, there are still flash floods generated in the lower valley uh, by uh, heavy rainfall. Um, so, for example, 2004, which was one of the largest floods on record, not really felt in the lower valley. Uh, there was a flood in 2017, which didn't have a huge impact in the lower valley, um, but did have an impact elsewhere. And you tended to see that the older generations have perhaps talked about no floods happening since closing the dam, but the younger generations uh, seem to remember sort of smaller flood events happening uh, since, you know, for example, 1998. Uh, so we then move on to, to the Andes, and uh, I think uh, time is, is uh, mar marching on, so I, I'll perhaps uh, skip to, to just showing uh, the range of dates of flooding that we saw in the Andes, uh, many more flood events perhaps than uh, in the lower valley, and the largest ones being 1906 and 1939. Um, again, similar things being remembered, so destruction of bridges, loss of life in this case as well, but destruction of bridges, restriction of movement, lots of channel change, uh, destruction of crops and impacting on farming, uh, and also the siting, the location of chapels and houses, etc. And um, there was less talk of community adaptation uh, in the Andes, so it's a less prevalent perhaps than it was in the lower Chubut Valley, less irrigation work, less community sort of um, adaptation to flooding um, and mitigation of flooding. Uh, again, as in Trelew, Trevelin town um, expanding towards the river on the floodplain, and they were heavily dependent on managing the channel and dam building as well. And in uh, the Andes, they were, there were more pressing environmental concerns for the, for the people in the Andes. So uh, less snow cover uh, in the Andes, uh, more concerns about drought, uh, decreases in sheep population. And they were very positive about dam building. Uh, they saw building dams as crucial to their future. And um, 
interestingly, we had a, an interesting experience where um, Keris, I think, had, had sent us this, um, Keris Griffith had sent us this uh, front page of Elchabut talking about an emergency uh, flooding being um, called and the governor of Chubut coming out to look at the river. And this, but this flood, when we got out there, um, was only mentioned by one person. And we were very confused why people weren't referencing this flood event. And it turned out that they saw this as only being what they called a crescida or a flow or a high flow event rather than an inundacion, which is a, which is a, a proper flood, if you like. So there's an interesting linguistic element that we need to be sort of uh, um, conscious of there. Um, so those are sort of the two um, uh, sort of flood chronologies side by side. It doesn't seem to be much flooding in the 1910s and 1920s, possibly reflecting a period of uh, lower flood frequency or, or drought, perhaps. Um, so just to finish off on my, my section, um, we sort of thought about what controls whether a flood event is remembered or not. Is there a threshold above which flood events are remembered? So is it to do with the size of the flood? Is it to do with how long a flood um, happens for? Is it to do more with the flood impacts? And the main uh, thing here is that if you look at the 1899 flood, which was a very large flood, it's remembered by remembered in in inverted commas, if you like, by nearly all of the interviewees. But you actually had a number of flood events in 1901 to 1903 as well. And they, 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 were, ba they were barely mentioned, if you like, uh, in, in the interviews. Uh, so the 1899 flood is really remembered in this oral and literary tradition of the Welsh community, whereas other floods perhaps aren't uh, to the same extent. I think it is to do with the size of the flood and, and its impacts. Um, so I'll, 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 I will skip, I'll skip through that to the, to the final uh, sort of conclusions uh, slide then. Um, from the British Academy project, the, we've seen that the documentary records related to Welsh Patagonia really do add to our knowledge of flood history uh, and allow us to look at historical perceptions of uh, flooding and drought in Patagonia. Um, we've seen that the rivers were really key to the uh, initial settlement, uh, the exploration and prosperity of the colony through the irrigation uh, scheme, but they also were uh, really a sort of binary relationship. They destroyed um, some of the infrastructure that they put in place often uh, as well. And some of the responses in the literature uh, are really kind of uh, very dramatic, very creative. Uh, they include sort of romantic style responses uh, as well. And we've seen the importance of the Welsh community and the Welsh culture in Patagonia to um, preserve, if you like, the memory of uh, these uh, events of flood, flooding, particularly much more so uh, than drought. Uh, and we've seen some examples of adaptation. Um, people have talked about adaptation in Patagonia quite a lot in the past, um, but uh, there's a number of examples that we've, we've seen in the historical documentation. And this kind of shows that adaptation is possible. Um, it's been possible in the past. Potentially, this is a kind of counterpoint to some of the more pessimistic anxieties over are we gonna be able to um, adapt in future? Um, and the final point, I guess, is that there's, there's scope to compare uh, the experiences in, uh, in Welsh Patagonia with other places that, that Stephen might talk about uh, and that has worked in, in other areas, for example, Southern Africa or, or Australia, where perhaps knowledge of past extremes, which is passed on through the, through the generations, could influence how we approach uh, environmental management uh, in, in future. Uh, so with that, I'll, I'll pass on to, uh, to Stephen for the rest of, of the talk. Okay. Uh... Thanks, Al. Let me just see whether I can request control. I'm going to request remote control. So that should come through, and then I can advance the slides. Um, so let's just see whether this works properly. Uh oh, what's happened? I, I've stopped sharing mine, but I can, I can share again if you want. Um, yeah. Yeah, okay. All right, maybe you're going to have to control the yeah, slide. No yeah. problem. Advance the slides in. <clears throat> this is obviously one of the hazards of uh, doing a talk by Zoom. So I'll just say next when I need you to advance help. 
Okay, so Notre Dame, good evening all. Thank you uh, for inviting us along, as Howell has said. So much of what Howell has been talking about is now published in a paper in Cultural Geographies. Um, please contact us if you'd like to have a copy of that and we'd be happy to supply it. Some of the concluding points from that paper, um, which Howell's already touched on really, are, are highlighted here in the red. Um, one, that there's widespread and still extant lay knowledge in the Welsh community, particularly regarding floods, but this is not being readily incorporated in policy making. So people are building now in flood prone locations, forgetting that in the past these, these locations had been subject to flood. There's opportunities to study the nature of flood and drought memories and lay knowledges, but rather than people writing things down there and posting letters, um, people are often tweeting or Facebooking or Instagramming their impressions or experiences. So perhaps we need to start looking at the different ways now that people record me memories. And then um, while we were obviously focusing on the Welsh speaking communities when we went out there, there's, you know, there's scope for doing similar things with um, memories arising from Spanish speaking or indigenous communities. So in other words, building more integrated, inclusive community memories of floods and droughts and other kinds of weather extremes. If you can advance the slide, please help. Okay, so in what follows, I wanna pick up on some of these themes of communicating, integrating memories and the role of social media. And I'm gonna focus on the lower Chubut Valley especially. And really the second phase of our work has started with this grant application made to the British Council in summer 2018. It was part of their higher education link scheme. And it was basically to progress research and development, but with relevance to student employability and competitiveness and to social innovation and inclusion. So it seemed to fit very nicely what, what we'd been trying to do already. And by this stage, we'd made contact with Gabriel Carles, uh, Universidad Nacional Pat de la Patagonia San Juan Bosco, or National University of Patagonia, who's proved to be invaluable for this next phase of the project. So I'd like to acknowledge uh, his input. Um, we put together a grant with Gabrielle basically to look at wet places in a dry land, securing ecosystem services from Patagonia's desert rivers and wetlands. And we looked at three things, or wanted to look at three things. One, we wanted to uh, continue the public perceptions of flood and drought risk, um, and particularly whether people saw dams still as the answer to controlling floods and managing droughts, or whether there was a growing sense that catchment based non-structural alternatives to flood and drought management um, might be used. So in, so in other words, not engineering based solutions, but um, more natural flood management techniques. And I'll, I'll come back to those. Secondly, to raise the profile of desert wetlands um, and what role they can play in flood and drought control. And I'll touch on that in a second. And then whether there were untapped opportunities around geo or ecotourism or geo ecotourism in Patagonia's deserts. I won't speak so much about that in this particular talk. Next slide, please, Hal. I'm going to focus uh, on what I say on the lower Chubut Valley, especially in the, in the other adjacent parts of the East Coast, not talk so much about the Andes um, here. Um, just a little bit of explanation. To, it may come as a surprise to many people to hear of the term <laughs> in drylands. Um, it sounds like an oxymoron, a contradiction in terms. Um, but you can find wetlands of all kinds uh, in most of drylands around the world. So there's an example here from Las Vegas, um, and that's Las Vegas Creek in the top image there. And in the 80s, that was severely eroded due to a whole series of flash floods that were occurring as the, the urban um, parts of Las Vegas were expanding very rapidly. And there was lots of urban runoff and, and lots of water being flushed down toilets and down drains. And it severely and badly eroded the creek and led to damage to a marina downstream. So they tried to do something about this and they constructed some wetlands in this particular case. They, they sort of um, slowed down the flow and they spread the flow and they established some wetland environments, which by all accounts have been quite successful in flood and erosion control. And it's had ecological and recreational benefits. So there are nature trails, there are cycling trails, there are running trails around this desert wetland. And if you look really carefully in that lower image, you can just see the strip of Las Vegas, the, the high rise buildings in the background there. So it's right on the doorstep of Las Vegas. If you can advance, Howard, please. 
And then here are some examples of uh, wetlands and drylands in Patagonia, or what are called magines. Um, some nice intact examples, the top two images there from the headwaters of rivers that drain eastward uh, towards the Atlantic Ocean. Um, and these do a really nice job in erosion control. Um, they act a bit like sponges as well, and they release water slowly during the drier parts of the year, ensuring flow downstream and, and sort of um, dampening the effects of droughts. They're very good at trapping sediment and pollutants that are coming downstream, but they are very fragile. They're, they're natural features, but vulnerable to mismanagement and erosion, for example, through overgrazing um, and flash floods that, that may occur. And you can see the, in the bottom image there, one of these former wetlands has been badly eroded out and um, has disappeared entirely. Next, please. Okay, so the workshop got underway. Um, the top image, so we had three days of activities, basically. The first day was um, on the Trelau campus of uh, National University of Patagonia. You can see the room there full of students and there was some water professionals there as well. So we had lectures. We had plenary discussions in both um, Spanish and English. And I sh we should thank our translator who's shown on that uh, image with Hal speaking on, on the right-hand side there who did simultaneous translation for us. Um, so we tr tried to keep it inclusive and accessible to those students whose, whose English wasn't quite so good. Um, and there were lots of plenary discussions. And on the second day, we went to Puerto Madryn and the CENPAT center there, which is the Centro Nacional Patagonico, which is basically um, a lot of government scientists there, water professionals, many of whom are linked with the eco-fluvial network. So we were getting our findings right out into, into those people who are charged with, with managing the environment, managing floods, managing droughts, managing the environment more broadly. And, and that was very productive as well. Next, please. We had breakout group discussions, um, both on the first day and the third day when we returned to Trelau campus. And um, yeah, this was interesting. Um, Howell alluded to some linguistic confusion earlier over, over uh, the different Spanish words for flood. So there's corriente, which is a flow, crecida, which is a kind of a, a higher flow really, but not a major flood, and an inundacion, which is a, a flood that overtops the banks and really causes a lot of damage. And um, the whole concept really of a wetland in a dryland caused a lot of confusion and uncertainty um, with some of the Spanish speaking students. The word for wetland that many Spanish speakers use is humedal. And they thought that a wetland by definition had to have water all the time. Whereas we were talking more about seasonal or ephemeral wetlands, which might, might dry out for a short period of time, but then reflood. Um, so, so that was interesting to, to get to the, uh, you know, to sort of start teasing apart some of these linguistic issues. Next slide, please. It also rained a lot when we were there. Um, the first day was boiling hot and then it started to rain. Actually, the first two days were fine. It was the th third day the rain started to come in. The top image there shows a local restaurant in Trelau, which, well, rain started to pour in through the roof while we were eating our dinner. Um, we'd planned to go out into the local desert, uh, which is only, you know, a short driveway, half an hour to an hour's drive from Trelau. And we headed out despite the bad weather. You can see it was raining quite hard. And when we got out into the desert, it didn't really look much like a desert other than the fact that the vegetation was very sparse. But you can already see there in that picture, water starting to pool on the surface. Next slide, please. And um, ostensibly we'd gone out there to look at this gauging network that Gabrielle and his colleagues had been installing to monitor flash floods. And they built up a, a really world-class data set now of flash floods and sediment movement down these streams. So we're standing in what are normally dry creeks 99% of the time. And um, the white uh, pipe there is a gauging station and there's all sorts of sediment monitoring equipment um, that they can gauge. And I was, well, I think Howell too, we were a little bit disappointed. We were thinking, oh, we, we were gonna see some of these creeks flowing. Um, it was raining hard, it had been raining hard, yet they were bone dry. Next slide, please. Until about an hour after we arrived in the desert when they suddenly were full of water. And this was great. I and mean, we were initially quite excited by this. Um, that picture on the lower there is, this, on the lower image is the same vantage point as the picture on the upper right. So you have got about a two meter deep flow down there flowing at about two to three meters a second. I mean, impossible to, to, to cross. Unfortunately, 
across that creek there was the track out of the desert. So we were stuck. And we spent a very uncomfortable few hours discussing what we were going to do. We couldn't get back to Trelaw or didn't think we were going to be able to get back to Trelaw. Uh, we had a flight out the next day. You know, we were panicking over this. We were faced with the prospect of staying in a kaolin plant overnight with very limited supplies. But luckily, the flow did drop. Next slide, please. And with a bit of trepidation, we did drive across the creek and just about get out. Um, now, I, I wrote this up as a, as a blog after we got back. Um, if you can advance, Howard, please. Um, the link there, if you're interested, uh, you can check out my impressions of the week, really, we spent in Patagonia, including this flash flood. And there's a select quote there, um, the bottom one. Eventually, we made it back to Trelao and the Parisia, which is a, the Spanish word for barbecue, basically. Tired, but with a tail that will live long in the memory. Advance, please. A tail that will live long in the memory. We've talked a lot about memories. And when I, when I wrote that in the blog, I, I really wasn't thinking this would be a memory of a flood event, but of course it is. It's a memory of a fl flood event that's now inscribed um, on a blog. And, you know, it might persist down the years. Someone might print it, someone might pass it on. It, it, it's, it's out there in the ether somewhere and it's probably beyond my control now. So these are, these are memories that are real to me, but they might become what Howell turned inherited or prosthetic memories to other people. They may, just may, live on into the future and become tomorrow's archives. And I'll come back to this um, just in a few minutes as I close off. Next slide, please, Howell. But the workshop expectations overall, you know, I think exceeded our expectations really. And we had very positive feedback. We had to do a lot of reporting for the British Council um, collecting uh, um, surveys from the participants. Next, please. And uh, just some of the things that they found really novel was, was the fact that the Welsh predominantly had been um, recording their perceptions and memories down the years. This came as a surprise to many Spanish speaking students. Um, yeah, they learned a lot about rivers and wetlands and the potential ecosystem services that can be provided by rivers and wetlands. We felt we'd, we'd really achieved what we wanted to do. Next slide, please. And uh, some of the key outputs were translations of brochures that I and others have put together over the years. So, Diez razones por las cuales la geomorfología de las humedales es importante, or 10 reasons why the geomorphology of wetlands is important. Um, advance, please. So that was a key publication we could distribute um, in Spanish. And also it led to the signing and um, really the cementation of a memorandum of understanding that we now have between Aberystwyth University and the National University of Patagonia. And that's in fact now been extended to 2024. Next slide, please. So we've made lots of plans for sort of additional work around our themes um, shown in here, floods and droughts, rivers and wetlands, ecosystem service and geotourism. We'd really put communicating what we do and why and how and when and where and to whom at the center of things. And we'd uh, had plans to go back out in 2020. Then, next slide please, our friend with the spike proteins comes along and puts the kibosh under most of our plans. Next slide please. So we couldn't go out in 2020. We also couldn't do the field work that Hal and I had planned to do on a different but related project in Jordan, which was looking more specifically at managing flood hazards in dryland rivers. So we had partners here at Mutar University in Jordan and Sheffield Hallam. Now flash floods in Jordan, it's one of the most water stressed countries in the world, but it's beset by flash floods from time to time, which not only affect the capital of Man and many other urban areas, but also uh, many rural parts of the country, in some cases lead to loss of life, a very tragic incident um, back in 2018 when a party of school children, um, was, many of them lost their life in this flash flood. Next slide, please. And, um, you know, Hal's already mentioned the fact that flash floods are occurring regularly and quite possibly more frequently in Patagonia. So there's been um, big floods in Puerto Madryn. This one's from 2016. Comodoro Rivadavia was badly impacted in 2017. And that's an example of some of the damage that resulted. Next slide, please. So uh, we put together a, a booklet called 10 points that everyone should know about flash floods, um, summarized in an infographic here. Um, I won't dwell on that. Next slide, please. 
but we did get it translated into Arabic. So we're trying to communicate to different language communities, not, not just to the English speakers, and particularly communicating to Arabic um, speaking local communities. To, so our collaborators in Jordan can speak to the local community, gather their views on what they see as flood ch challenges. Maybe they've got local solutions that they can identify that are fit for their particular area. Maybe they can start to talk about flood memories and drought memories and, and, and develop some community memories that might increase flood resilience going forward. Can you advance, please? And then um, Howells in particular has started to look at global flood monitor, which is just one example now of the tools that are out there to start harvesting social media. So in this particular case, if you can read that on the screen there, it says the global flood monitor detects flood events by automatically analyzing tweets in 11 languages. And then um, the, the historic and real time events are shown on a map. So you can basically click around the world and find a whole range of tweets and a whole range of languages about floods. And um, Howell started to uh, ha harvest some of these for Jordan. And in theory, you could do this for Patagonia or for any other part of the world. So, you know, the Jordan project as well had started to coalesce around this idea of communicating, integrating memories, harvesting social media and so on, which brings us back to Patagonia. Next slide, please. Um, this is a slide I started with. So we can definitely uh, start to address and really move forward on these points that I'd highlighted on the right hand side of this slide. Next slide, please. So really, just to finish off, um, COVID has been a, a real challenge, but it's also forced new opportunities for knowledge sharing. In fact, we're taking part in one of these new ways tonight, a Zoom meeting, which you know would have been unthinkable two, two or three years ago. And there are disadvantages, of course, but there are also benefits, and particularly for transnational educational initiatives. So um, with Gabrielle and another colleague, Jose Paredes, we trialed what we termed a, a mirror lesson or a clase espejo, looking at flash floods in drylands. We did this just before Christmas. Um, advance, please, Hal. So we invited um, colleagues and students on both sides of the Atlantic, but predominantly focusing on the, the Spanish speaking students uh, down in Argentina to produce a whole series of digital materials and have a, dis a Zoom based discussion session around the challenge, the global challenge of flash floods. And we particularly asked the students and staff involved um, for whether they've witnessed any flash flood events or are there any memories of flash flood events in their family, whether they could provide any anecdotes or um, photos. Um, we also asked them what they thought the strategies and measures that could be implemented in order to raise awareness or mitigate the damage from flash floods could be. So in other words, asking for input or creating what social scientists call a sense of agency amongst pe people to start building up community engagement and community resilience to these hydrological extremes. Next, next slide, please. So there were lots of aims of these uh, Clase Espejo, um, you know, improving subject knowledge, increasing technical and foreign language skills, but it was more the opportunities for sharing of personal experiences of flash flooding and demonstrating how personal and community memories provide a key resource that can help tackle this key global challenge. So you can see the, the digital resources there on screen and that was Jose Paredes um, appearing in our, in our Zoom meeting. So they're basically a pre-recorded videos by ourselves, um, short talks. Importantly, Gabrielle had taken the, the 10 reasons why flash floods are important document, which was based on global examples and had provided regional or local examples to illustrate each of those 10 points. So down, what, what people call downscaling the issue to situations that the students would be more familiar with. Next slide, please. And we know that flash flooding and flooding more generally is a key global challenge. It's a growing one. We know that a warmer atmosphere means that the uh, moisture holding capacity of the atmosphere increases. So when it does, when that moisture does fall as rain, it can fall in larger amounts at once. So we have extreme rainfall, which translates into extreme flooding. Advance, please, Hal. And we've, uh, we've, we've seen increasing case studies from around the world. We had some very bad flash floods in Germany and parts of Belgium last summer, of course. And Wales is not immune either. And I wrote a piece up in the National um, back in the autumn talking about the challenges of manning, 
managing flash floods in a changing climate, focusing on, on some Welsh uh, examples there. Next slide, please. Um, I won't dwell on this, but we, the management options that we have for flash floods are similar regardless of setting. Okay, the key point really is to slow the flow and to spread the flow. I think I used that term earlier using the case study of Las Vegas as an example. The three curves there, if you just look on the right hand graph really, that the, the graph is one of discharge, which is the volume of water per second going down the channel and time on the X axis. And those three curves, A, B and C, have the same volume of water in them. So the area under the curves is, is the same, but they, they're obviously spread out differently over time. And the idea is to spread a very peaked, short, sharp flash flood out into something more like curve C. And the peak of that flood stays below the erosion threshold of the channel. And if we can do that, we can, we can manage floods a lot better. If you can just advance, please, Hal. <clears throat> and we, we have some of the solutions for doing that. We know what they are. We know we can maintain or establish wetlands in headwaters. We can restore peat bogs. We can un undertake hillside tree planting schemes. We can put po porous paving in urban areas. All of these things help towards slowing the flow and spreading the flow. But, but, where do we go from here? Okay, this is where I sh shall stop, I think. Um, it's where my particular expertise stops and where I start to stray into all kinds of difficult political territory. But if there are questions about this, I'm happy to <laughs> have a stab at on answering them. I'm just gonna hand back to Hal and he can sort of conclude and um, give our thanks uh, to our funders. Thanks, Stephen, and uh, thank you, everybody, for uh, for listening. Sorry if we've uh, strayed a little bit over the over the time, uh, but uh, I'll finish there with uh, a photograph of uh, Avon Camoy, uh, Rio Chubut, full of sediment uh, from uh, from the bridge uh, in Gaiman, and um, and just uh, just to acknowledge uh, the many uh, funding uh, organisations that have funded this, so British Academy, British Council, uh, but also the people in Patagonia who helped and the people uh, in Wales who helped us organise the trips as well, including Keris uh, and uh, our sort of tour company as well, Tango Tours, and uh, Gabriel Kales and, and his colleagues in Patagonia uh, as well. Um, so it was very much a sort of uh, collective effort, uh, a lot of this field work. Uh, so thank you very much once again uh, for the invitation uh, to talk to you uh, tonight. Uh, hopefully it's given you a, a taste of some of the work that, uh, that we do on flooding. Uh, in, in Aberystwyth. And uh, as Stephen mentioned, if there are any questions, if there's time for any questions, we'd be very, very happy to, to try and answer them. So thank you very much once again. Thank you both for uh, sharing your research this evening. And as you're happy to take questions, is there, has anybody got, um, got a question for either Howell or Stephen? It was a lot to take on. <laughs> it was a, it was a it was a lot to sort of take on. Um, but surely somebody yeah. has got. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. yeah. Hi. Uh, Di here. Actually, can, can I thank you both, Jochum uh, uh, um and, and Stephen? Excellent uh, discourse there. Um, obviously, um, a couple of points. One is historical about who he was in 1862 and that promise of 142. Um, rainfall days per year was that based on fact or was that just based on some wild promise of should i say the 1862 version 1865 version of sunlit brexit uplands uh, or was it actually a, a basis in fact um and whether um, the more serious question is um as regards uh, flash floods and controls what consideration is there given in addition to everything that that has been done as regards new wetlands and everything else to actually capturing heavy rainfall as it falls, capturing and storage of rainfall um, rather than let it go into the drains. You know, let's let's have a pre-drain, even pre-wetland type um, situation where we actually capture the rainfall. You know, use rain like we use oil, dare I suggest. 
I uh, don't how know. do you want to take that, or shall yeah. I? Yeah, I'll, 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 I'll have a stab at it. Yeah, <laughs> first, and if you if you want to add that, would be good. Do you have a I am a I'm a question. Um, I think for um, uh, Hugh Hughes, I, I th- I, I've read. I think I read that it wasn't just sort of wild wild guesswork. I think I, but it, but it was it was based on a very um, uh, how shall I put it? Uh, basic kind of calculation of looking at which was I think you know quite wide widely done at the time in in a sense of looking at what the rainfall is at various latitudes and then trying to average it out to, to what it's like in the middle and uh, obviously not kind of taking into account uh, different um, different areas you know and uh, so I, th- I think it you know it, it, it I don't think I don't think there was a um, uh, I think it was a, a, a sort of a mistake based on um, yeah, sort of a relatively basic understanding of climatology, um, uh, and and I, I'll say if if he would if he'd been talking about the Andes, then he'd probably be a bit closer uh, closer to to the mark, I think. Uh, but yeah, uh, in in the second question, I think that that's that's an interesting point because I, I think I can't remember where I read this in quite recently. Um, uh, there's a number of um, uh, suggestions. For, for example, you know, can we harvest? Should every house have a, a water butt to harvest harvest water? You know, to to try and stop uh, to to try and deal with that. And and there's also, of course, a um, a, a big focus on uh, wetland and and bog restoration uh, in in Wales, um, which 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 is you know doesn't quite yeah doesn't quite sort of make use of the water for, for, for our purposes in some ways but um but it's very a very good thing um um the tree you know on a, on a slightly different note i think the tree planting uh, example is um uh, is an interesting one there's, there's a re- very recent study that's come out that says that you know uh, the the benefits of um Tree planting on on the largest floods perhaps aren't as 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 big as uh, what you might expect, um, and I think you know there's things you can do to slow down, to to mitigate some flood events, but it, but a large flood event is going to going to have impacts um, of some kind of another. There's not much you can do about the very large events, but perhaps you can you can um, you can do things about the, the the smaller events. I don't know, Steve, Stephen, maybe I don't know, you can... Yeah, I, I mean, I think you covered the Hugh, Hugh's uh, calculation point. That was exactly what he did. So it was it, it was a flawed methodology, but um, reasonable, I think, given, given the era when he was doing it. Um, in terms of managing the biggest floods, I mean, one thing we should say is floods, floods are natural phenomenon. And in fact, they are important um, for many ecosystems. So, you know, many benthic organisms, so those that live on the bottom of rivers, thrive on the on the, the disturbance provided by floods. Um, so the, the aim isn't to completely do, do away with floods. And in fact, floodplains often get their fertility from the fact they are plains that flood, or historically used, used to flood, and they would bring sediment out and sediment is laid down and that, that renews the fertility of the soils. The problem, um, uh, and also in in an arid environment like Patagonia, floods are essential for for groundwater recharge as well. So you, as they travel downstream from snowmelt in the Andes and are supplemented by rainfall, perhaps a lot of the water seeps out through the dry bed and banks, and it goes to groundwater, um, which farmers can draw on for livestock and so on. So it's not a case of trying to prevent floods. I think it's managing the damaging effect of floods and 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 maximizing the beneficial um, aspects of floods. Um, but in terms of harvesting rainwater, no, I don't, neither in Wales nor in Patagonia do I get the sense people are doing this on a wide scale, and perhaps they should be. I mean, if you, I've travelled around Germany, for instance, and, um, you know, a lot of people are harvesting rainwater off their roofs, they wash their clothes in rainwater. We do not need treated water to wash our clothes. It's ridiculous. We, we don't need treated water to flush our toilets. You can, you can plumb your houses to flush your toilet perfectly adequately with rainwater. Uh, but British housing is just not geared up for that. And unfortunately, even new housing isn't really being geared up for, for that. So hopefully that's answered the question to some extent. Thank you. Is there another, has anybody else got a question? Uh, Lyndon, 
Um, obviously, you've touched on the international dimension and the fact your proposed trip to Jordan had to be uh, put back. I must admit, I hadn't been uh, aware of the uh, flooding in Jordan, but I've been very much aware of the flooding in India and in Pakistan, which um, obviously has been quite severe, resulting in the loss of, uh, loss of life. And I wondered in this international dimension where the consideration is being cons uh, taken uh, into account about such areas as uh, India and uh, Pakistan. Uh, yeah, perhaps I'll, perhaps I'll tackle that one. Um, it is, but not not by us, because uh, I don't, I mean, I've traveled around India, but I've, I've never um, undertaken a research project there. To some extent, they were kind of a different sort of flood. Um, they're monsoon driven floods predominantly. So, uh, you know, you have, you can have very heavy monsoon seasons, which fall on the, on the Himalaya and um, lead to severe flooding downstream. A lot of rivers, very big rivers feeding out of the Himalaya, converging onto very low lying floodplains. Um, and obviously very high population de densities living on those floodplains creates all kinds of problems. Um, those sorts of floods, yeah, they're, they're very, very challenging to manage. I mean, there are some things you can do in urban areas, obviously like having improved um, <clears throat> urban planning. So, trying to minimize the building of houses in flood prone locations but um that is a challenge in places like india and pakistan and even in argentina where some of the biggest fatalities and, and damage from flood has come simply because people have built houses in um, barrancos or arroyos you know these dry gullies which may be in people's recent memories of not flooded but they're part of these drainage networks which occasionally get activated in the very biggest events um so yes uh, th there are there are lots of people looking at the flooding issues on the indian subcontinent but that's not something Hal and i have got direct experience of thank you is there another question yeah Carmen, if i can uh, yes you in terms of uh, flood hazard uh, research uh, and management in the UK, obviously, there's a big debate about channelization of uh, rivers and uh, levees and uh, protecting urban spaces, really. I was just wondering, is, is that debate reflected in Argentina, and in particular, in terms of the political um, structure in Argentina, how high up the um, uh, agenda is uh, the area that you talked about tonight, Chubut, in terms of regional uh, input as opposed to international, is it, is it an area that uh, receives um, uh, economic support to uh, deal with flooding there? Uh, obviously, we've got some form of uh, parallel debates here in terms of devolved government in Wales versus the responsibility of uh, central government in London. Yeah. Shall I have a stab at that to start with, Hal? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't like to speak for all of Argentina because um, it's obviously a very big country and, it, and it, it's a very different setup to um, to the UK. So the provinces have, I th as I understand it, quite a lot of power over what they do um, and to some extent act quite independently of the federal government. And then local flood management has devolved down to, down to particular uh, urban areas and so, so on. So... The short answer is I think it's very patchy. I think in some provinces and some areas it's risen right up the agenda. So, uh, and, I, and I say that um, because, you know, as I said, we're working with Gabrielle Carles and colleagues who have very advanced ideas about how to deal with um, the flood management challenge. You know, the, 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 their thinking is aligned with our thinking coming from, coming from Europe. And uh, they've got links into, you know, all the right government networks and so on. So I, th I think they are pushing it up the agenda, but I don't know how widespread that is throughout Argentina. I suspect in some areas, there's still a lot of push for structural controls, channelizing things, dredging, just raising the levees higher and embankments higher and higher and higher, which, you know, it deals with the flooding problem in the short term, but commonly transfers the flooding problem to areas downstream and can encourage very risky behavior like encroachment onto floodplains and building 
houses effectively on the levees. I mean, we saw some pretty tragic examples in Trelao uh, where, where this had been done and people were like, oh, well, well, the dam's upstream, it protects us. Well, yeah, I mean, it kind of does, but if that dam ever fails, um, you know, you're, you're gonna be in real tr trouble. And of course the dam has trapped water and sediment um, and, and the, the channel downstream is constricted now so much, particularly through the growth of invasive willows that floods that come in to the river in small tributaries downstream of the dam are now creating flooding problems where there wasn't one before. So yeah, I'm meandering around a bit there. Maybe I'll leave Hal to- uh, Yeah, uh, I, th I think the only thing I'd add there, I think it, it, um, there's, a, there's an interesting aspect related to the wetlands in, in Patagonia where you know the wetlands are the wetlands provide a source of water don't they i think stephen for agriculture and, and sometimes for drinking water as well and where i think good environmental management or good management of the river catchment would just leave the wetland be and and let it you know you know let let you know not not extract water from it i think there's obviously pressure increasing pressure on water resources on the on the pipe on the on the on the desert so there's more pressure to ex to extract water from the wetlands rather than leave the wetlands to operate as as a sponge for water that can have all kinds of different benefits so i think there is you know a similar debate you know, and uh, yeah in in many countries you know not wales and argentina included and that, thank you yeah. thank you um time for one more question can I ask one, uh, Carmen? Yes, yeah, yeah, sure, Andrew. Uh, Stephen, you just mentioned very briefly uh, geotourism or ecotourism. Mm. I wonder if you could mm. say something a bit more about that. Well, the idea is to is to um, base tourism um, more around sort of natural features of the landscape. I mean, to some extent, you know, people go to Argentina for for the natural wonders, right? Um, so. If you were to think of Argentina, I don't know how many of you have been there, but you, you might think of Iguazu Falls right up in the north with Brazil. That's a that's a water, major waterfall, major set of waterfalls, really. Um, you might think of the Andes. Um, but it's it's kind of looking for lesser visited parts of the landscape where you could base attractions around uh, natural features. So the Chubut River runs through the middle of um, the Pyth. And it's a fantastic, uh, you know, we've, we've been on some tours with, with uh, um, a contact of ours um, in, in a scale who's taken us to some of the most amazing scenery. I mean, amazing scenery, you know, extinct volcanoes that have been eroded out and the colours are spectacular, but they're just not, not known about um, at all. You know, they're, they're, they're not marketed in a sustainable way as a visitor attraction yet, could be. So it's... It's looking for opportunities like that. Maybe some of these fantastic machines, you know, in the headwaters of, of the Andes, you know, they're fantastic uh, landscapes. They're very photogenic, but they're also um, spots where there's abundant bird life, you know. Uh, so you could base um, bird birding tours around some of these wetlands. So it's looking for opportunities like that to have um, relatively high cost, but low volume tourism and, and, and um, I, I guess help some of the people who are, who are trying to manage this land diversify their income a little bit. So if we if we are to look after the the wetlands and tell the farmers, look, you really can't overstock these environments and you shouldn't be extracting so much water from them, they're going to say, well, yeah, but I need to 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 eke a living off this land. If you can say to them, look, but you can you can market this as um, get uh, getaway retreats. So wealthy people, perhaps from Buenos Aires or whatever, come out to Patagonia for a weekend. They go into one of these uh, lesser visited parts of Patagonia, they do some birding, they go and visit this amazing extinct eroded volcano and help farmers or other local landowners generate some income through through that. Does that, does that answer your question? Mm, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Okay, I'll pass you over to Andrew um, for the thanks, vote of thanks, please. Thank you, Carmen. Well, diolch yn iawn i'r ddau ohonna chi am uh, gyflwyniad, well, dau gyflwyniad, hollol rhyfelol, uh, yn enwedig uh, i rhywun fel fi, uh, sydd wedi ymweld ar y ladfa, sydd yn, uh, sydd yn gwlad hollol rhyfelol. Um, thank you very much for two really excellent um, presentations on a really, really fascinating topic.
and um, it would be for anybody. I think several people here probably have been to Patagonia and uh, if you've been to Patagonia, you'll never ever forget it. It's just a life-changing event. Um, uh, fascinating for everybody. I remember Cuffin Williams actually saying uh, many times uh, that it was his visit to Patagonia which changed his entire artistic life and he was never the same uh, after that. Um, what struck me to begin with was uh, what an interesting project this has been uh, from the point of view of bringing together uh, art, culture, history, literature and so on uh, on the one hand and science and engineering on the other and the third element of course which is communic science communication and uh, sharing of information so it's a really really fascinating uh, project. You're struck, of course, and uh, if you go to Patagonia, you, you, you're immediately struck by, uh, by the way in which the settlers there, the Welsh settlers, um, adapted and uh, adapted so quickly in the first place uh, to uh, having all their expectations or hopes uh, overturned by the reality of what they saw there. Um, and then how they adapted to the climate by uh, irrigating uh, the land. I remember going to Dol Avon, I think, and being amazed by uh, the irrigation channels and the wheels and everything that are there. Um, and then coping with flooding and, and other events. Uh, so they were incredibly uh, adaptable. And uh, uh, what you said, Howell, about um, you know, how fast can you adapt uh, to rapidly changing climate um, it's very interesting one. Perhaps, it, perhaps we're too pessimistic about how uh, quickly we can adapt as a society to, to big changes. Um, the other thing that really struck me about uh, Howell's talk was the, um, the, the evidence of memory and uh, how uh, memory survives of these big uh, climatic changes and events. Um, and not just memories, but memories of memories of memories, not going right back to uh, prehistory or myth, as in the case of Cantre Guaylod. Uh, just really, really interesting. And how culturally determined all these memories are, they don't perhaps necessarily um, just link with the size of the disasters that have happened in the past. Um, memories too of, of the pride of, uh, of, of actually overcoming the problems with, with things like irrigation. But then of course we, the long memories but they're also short memories and we know uh, here as well as in Patagonia that um, people build on floodplains um, just entirely forgetting uh, what has happened in the past. Um, so really really interesting from that point of view. Um, Stephen's uh, part of the talk on what you did in Patagonia is really interesting not just getting stranded on the wrong side of the river uh, but what you did with, uh, with students and others uh, to share and communicate and, and educate. Uh, a tremendous example of international cooperation. Really, really uh, interesting. And um, at the end there saying how, you know, maybe some of the solutions are the same the world over. For example, coping with flooding uh, by better water management upstream, leaving wetlands alone and so on. Um, so we probably could have gone all, all evening a lot longer. Uh, with questions and answers, but uh, Stephen, uh, thank you, Andrew. Well, thank you, everybody, for attending this evening. Um, it's great to see you all. Um, just remember the for members the AGM um, later this month, and for those of you who aren't members, check out our website and see what see what we get up to, and maybe join. So, no star, everybody, and um, I'll see you soon. Thank you.